If you've listened to me talk any time in the last six months, you've heard me drone on about purpose. In my mind, purpose and money are intimately tied together and happiness or contentedness or self-actualization, whatever you want to call it, requires a sense of knowing your purpose. Yet this weekend, we are live at Camp Fi Southwest. Make some noise. And amongst many heated arguments, I've been regaled with the viewpoint that purpose is not only unnecessary, but may be harmful. May in fact be toxic. Today, we talk with three Camp Fi participants and ask two questions. One, What is the relationship between money, financial independence, and purpose? And two, can searching for purpose actually be counterproductive? To begin to answer these questions, we are first going to welcome Jeremy Schneider. Jeremy, welcome to Earn and Invest. Tell us about your path to financial independence. I was a college kid during the dot-com boom, and I saw a bunch of other young people starting these tech companies and retiring, and this was before I had heard of the fire movement or financial independence. And that looked, that sounded good to me. It's like starting this tech company and making a lot of money. And so that was the path I went. I turned down a job offer from Microsoft. I started an internet company. It went really poorly for several years, but I finally found my way. I grinded through and eventually uh, the company was doing better. I sold it for $5 million when I was 34. I quit the job working for the company that acquired me when I was 36. And I found myself in my mid-30s retired, financially independent with not a need for, for work. So talk about the psychology of getting a windfall. Because in a sense, you were not financially independent. You sell this company, you get a bunch of money. How did that affect you? Before I sold the company, I was living on $36,000 a year. I drove a 99 Ford Explorer. I lived in a garage converted to an apartment. Um, I was the lowest paid employee in my company. And so my experience was very strange because I became wealthy in an instant. I literally have a video of me clicking refresh on my bank account and it going from $100,000, which was my lifetime savings, to over $2 million, which was the first payment of, for my company. Um, and I had this weird period of four months before that bank account refresh where I knew or I knew with great likelihood the company was going to sell and for how much. And so I was able to do these thought experiments without actually spending the money. So I said, I could buy a Lamborghini. You know, what's that cost? A few hundred thousand dollars. I'll have a couple of million. Um, but then as I sat with that, I thought, where would I park it? And I would look like a giant, gigantic douchebag to my friends. Um, and I, I realized like Lamborghini life was not for me. Um, <laughs> and, and so I, I guess, you know, before the click refresh my bank account moment, I always thought I'm going to sell the company. Dad's the finish line. I'll like triumphantly raise my arms over my head. I'll fly to a beach somewhere and I will have won. Um, and then after the bank account refresh moment, life just kept going on and you have the same friends you had before and you don't go to a beach because now you have to like work at this job that you just got acquired by. Um, and, and the one thing that did happen is money was no longer the primary tension in my life. I had enough because I was living on so little. I was kind of instantly at what I would consider financial independence. And I had to kind of look to see what was the point of my life. You know, I was this tech guy trying to start a company, trying to hit the finish line. And I hit it. And, and now what? And that was a question that I hadn't really thought about a whole lot before that moment. Tell me about the first six months after you sold Rental Links, right? Rental Links was the name of this company that you sold for $5 million. What did you do for that first six months? Uh, I had a job for the first time in my adult life. I worked for the company that bought, um, bought my company. And so for the next two years, I was just an employee of this company. I was probably working as harder or harder than I did when I was the owner because I had to like answer to bosses and stuff. And so my, you know, maybe what you're getting is like the real moment of like abyss was when I quit my job two years after I sold my company where I was now, I was without purpose. You know, I was just a dude who had a a bank account. So what did you do? Well, um, I play beach volleyball, not today, sorry, but, um, I, 
had friends who would always go to Italy every um, summer and coach beach volleyball for this like organization out there. And I could never go because I was a grown up with a job. And so three or four days after I quit my job, I was on a plane to Italy and I lived there for two months and was coaching volleyball for two months. And just, and then for the following year, I basically just did what I thought retired people were supposed to do. I played video games all day and I traveled and I worked out and I, you know, cooked and whatever, you know, you're supposed to do that was fulfilling. Um, and I, and I think that most people think that's their dream, you know, whatever their, I mean, obviously it's not volleyball forever, but whatever their version of that is. But for me, a year into that, I, I started to feel more empty. Did you use like this word or concept of purpose? Were you like, I need to find a purpose? Was it something that specific with you or was it just, I'm feeling empty and I'm not exactly sure why I'm not fulfilled? I didn't ever use the word purpose. The word that occurred to me is the word tension um, because suddenly there was no tension in my life. It was just lax, loose. I could wake up whenever I want, go to sleep whenever I want. I wasn't building anything. No one really depended on me. And so there's no tension in my life, but maybe it's the same thing in a different package. Um, and, and I think that I needed that tension. And I think for most people, tension or money is the primary tension in their life. If I got that next raise, if I got the bigger house, if I got the bigger car, if I had my FI number or whatever it is, then I would be happier. Then I would be successful or that would be the finish line. And so when that, when you hit, when attention's removed, for me, though, it left an empty spot. Do you think there'll be a time in your life where you no longer need that tension? I- I'm thinking about this idea of you thought money, in a sense, was the goal. So then you knew you were going to get this windfall and you're like, I win. I've hit my number. I got the money, whatever it is. I win. If now you realize that something was missing, that you needed this tension in your life for it to feel fulfilling, what does winning look like now? I mean, it gets very cerebral because you, you were chasing that goal for so long and then that goal is accomplished. And so I think for me, winning is, is two things. One, being happy, which obviously is not a simple, uh, <laughs> simple question. And two is helping people. And, and so now instead of chasing a bank account number, I chase, you know, can I convert money to happiness? I think the opportunities to do so are less frequent than we all imagine. And I try to when I can. And, um, and how can I help people? And so now that's, that's basically what I'm chasing. And, and I'm, I've installed tension in my life, which now has taken the form of starting another company, which tries to achieve those goals of happiness and helping people. We are part of the financial independence community, maybe previously called the financial independence retire early community, because a lot of people really hold tightly onto this idea of possibly retiring one day. Is there a time in your life you think you'll quote unquote retire where maybe you'll stop doing things that happen to feel like employment or or things that you make money doing? Yeah, retire is a loaded word. Like my Instagram bio, the first line says retired at 36 because it's this loaded word and people associate with old people. Um, And so when people hear that I'm retired, I think they might think that I like sat on a like rocking chair on my porch with a blanket over my legs all day or something. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't think so. Like, I think if I'm a 70 year old dude, I think I'm out there like raising money for charity or donating money to charity or being a mentor or coach or, you know, I, I think there'll always be something, you know, I, I'll probably dial back as energy allows or whatever. Um, but I think that if there's no tension, if there's no purpose, if there's no goal, that would suck, you know, being 70 and no one like having no, no purpose, like no reason to get up, no one counting on you, no, nothing to work towards. Even if, you know, I mean, my mom is turning 70, so hopefully it's not the end of life, but 80, 90, whatever it is, like, you know, I don't want, it seems very sad when you picture someone in like a nursing home without the tension, without the purpose. So I don't, I don't want that. I, I want to, you know, have that and then die one day in a long time. We are having this conversation and we are at Camp Phi Southwest. Just wondering, when you decided to come here to be a speaker at this event, did you think we'd be having these kind of conversations? And what do you think, what did you think you were going to get out of coming here to Camp Phi Southwest? So this is my first Camp Phi. And so I'm giving you my like live interpretation. There's a lot less technical analysis than I imagined, you know, in 
my like daily life helping coaching people with with money problems there's a lot of like how do i pay off debt you know what's a good interest rate what is a rate of return on index funds what's a good expense ratio i think here a lot of people have kind of got the math largely behind them and now are dealing with the emotional aspect and um you know that's above my pay grade to be honest you know, like i'm also <laughs> drowning in that ocean of figuring it out um but i guess that's why we're all here it's like the support group of you know what is enough uh you know do i have purpose what is the real goal of life if money is not things like that now i imagine a lot of people listening to this are thinking you know is camp something i should do Compare and contrast the community that you met here today compared to maybe the community that you have on Instagram and Personal Finance Club. You know, this is the people here are not, you know, if you go to any Walmart in the U.S. and talk to 10 people, it's going to be a very different community than the people you find here. Uh, no disrespect to Walmart shoppers because <laughs> there are some great deals to be had. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the the people, and, and it's kind of shocking to me, you know, there's 60 people here of 300 million people in the U.S., but I think most people in the U.S. are, even in, in my community, which is people who are interested in finance, are, you know, worried about credit cards and points and, and you know, job changes and things like that. And I think that's all partially on our mind, too. But I think here there's a lot of, I don't know, like, successful people and various stages of their financial independence journey who are very thoughtful about the process and the journey and what money means to them. And, um, you know, in, in a, in a slightly deeper way than getting the spreadsheets, right? Although I think there's probably a lot of spreadsheet nerds here too, but it comes up less in conversation this weekend in my experience so far. Jeremy, in a moment, we're going to welcome David to the microphone, but before we do Tell people a little bit about what Personal Finance Club is and how people can reach you if they want to know more. It's a community of champions of the individual investor, just teaching about personal finance literacy, helping helping learn the stuff we probably should have all learned in high school. I'm an easy dude to find online, personalfinanceclub.com. Instagram is where I create most of my content, at Personal Finance Club. I just got the blue check verification like three days ago, so I'm obviously telling everybody. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's where you can find Thank you, Jeremy Schneider. Let's have a round of applause. And next up, we welcome to the mic, David. David, many of us are looking to be financially independent and ditch the nine to five. That's why a lot of people eventually come to Camp Fi. Is it okay to just be escaping from something or do we also have to be running towards something else? I think that's an excellent question, Jordan. Uh, for me being 27, I think a lot of me being in the millennial category, I'm, on, I'm surrounded by a lot of people that are searching for that question, that feel like they need to answer that. And the more that I'm surrounding myself around other circles, I'm realizing that like maybe you don't need to answer that question. And I've experienced times of like one of my toxic traits is toxic positivity. And I consider myself a huge optimist, but it's taken me, I would say the last four years of strong humility where I realized that like some people don't crave to be optimists in their life. And I think the same would apply to like purpose is that like I used to grow up thinking that you needed to have that answered very naively to the point where it was toxic to be around me. And I think the more that I've been around older circles and realizing like where they define that or choose not to define that has been very humbling for me. But it, I don't know that until I surround myself in those circles. And I think that's a lot of my generation is thinking that you need to have it answered because we haven't bothered to ask the older generations of like, hey, you don't have this answered and is it eating you up at night? And I think the answer more than not is it's not. And I think that's what's been kind of like a gut check. You know, it's one thing again to say, okay, we don't need to have a purpose. The other thing to, is to actually go as far as to say, not only do we not need to have a purpose, but searching for a purpose could actually be damaging. Tell me a little bit more about that. Why, especially for your generation, let's say we're talking about millennials or maybe Gen Z, 
why for this generation could this idea or need to search for purpose actually be a problem? I think a lot of it starts with framing with what is your definition of purpose and see, and that's where my approach working with like college age students, specifically college age men. I oftentimes when I go through these thought exercises is like, whoa, 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 time out. Let's get on the same page of the word. That's like, you can talk about success in circles with people because the word success is so elusive, so vague. So I think. A lot of times my generation, their definition is projected onto them through older generations and they have struggled with reframing that. So truthfully, if you were to ask me like, Hey, David, what is, do you think purpose is like necessary? I think yes, but that's just because I've rationalized that I think we can reframe the definition. I don't think that everybody's gotten to that though. And that's okay. That is not up for me to say, you need to reframe your definition of purpose. It is it, it connotations and denotations. Those are two separate things. You know, you, you can create your own definition of purpose, but that's easier said than done. And I've been here this weekend and realized that some people are still wrestling with reframing that definition because they haven't had permission to do so yet. Tell me about what the old definition of purpose is and what the reframe is. Funny enough, this is my background on my phone. It's the Ikigai which is where what you love doing overlaps with what the world needs with overlaps with what you can be paid for with what you overlaps with what you are good at. And so people in my generation, it's like, Oh wow, this is sweet. There's a Venn diagram that like can help be this guiding principle. And so where what you love doing overlaps with what you're good at is your passion with what you love doing overlaps with which the world needs is your mission with what the world needs over last week, you can be paid for is vocation and the other one is profession. And where it all intersects is purpose. But that's a very like capitalistic view of purpose. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's exactly what I was thinking. I was interested to see that what you can make money at was included in that. Tell me how important is money to purpose? Are they connected or are they separate? And I think that's where a lot of younger people, both gener millennials and Generation Z, think that it has to be that it has to be providing stability. And I think that's the word that gets mixed up is like income versus stability. And I think stability can be a myriad of things, but I think most of people think stability as directly correlated to income. But once again, it's still, that's a very specific angle of seeing as purpose as like fulfilling that financial need or Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like that angle. You know, and I, it's not until I've like, once again, meet older people that whether they're empty nesters, they're taking care of older ones or taking care of people that aren't even related to them. It's not monetarily driven whatsoever. And so it's refreshing for me to get that. And which is why I come to weekends like this, knowing like, yeah, I'm going to be the minority of type of person, but I want that. I'm specifically trying to be in those circles to get that extra perspective that I think my generation needs more of. So I have like friends waiting, like, okay, so what happened? Well, what was the weekend like? <laughs> Some of the conversations, who'd you meet? Like, I want to hear like everything. Do you think one of the reasons that purpose might be toxic, especially to some other younger generations or, or even people of older generations who are struggling with this right now, is one of the reasons that we associate purpose with grandiosity, like your purpose has to be this big thing, like changing the world or having an impact. Is, is that part of what maybe makes it feel so toxic? I think that's what makes it toxic, but also exciting. Hmm. I think we purposely like want that. And when I talk with like college students that are in those positions, they recognize it. They're not unaware that they're doing that to themselves, but it's like that or what? You know, it's like, okay, maybe I don't need to li live a life of grand significance, but you know, I, you know, if I stumble along the way, I'm going to probably just be in a better position anyway. So I see a lot of college students that are pre-law going the med, med route and it's like, do you love it? They're like, no, but even if I am bad at it, I'm going to do decent. At least that's their belief. So it's like, they're willing to put up with it for a while rather than asking those tough questions. At the beginning of this, you hedged a little bit. You said, well, maybe me personally, I think that we should be pursuing purpose, et cetera. But now that you've talked to a lot of people, you realize that purpose, searching for purpose actually can cause more harm than good. Tell us about your personal beliefs. How does purpose play a role in your life? 
So let me rephrase. I do believe that purpose is worth searching for. And I think that's, it's a matter of semantics. I think that's what we get held up on is defining the word. And I do think it's something that we should be striving for. I think people still need permission. And I think that permission is uncovering certain traumas. And that's where it's very much above my pay grade. It's very much above many people's pay grades. But I don't think that that means it's not worth going down. Like you need to uncover why finances are such this trigger point in your life and how you project it onto other people. Because that's where when we talk about generational wealth, it's like generational traumas just as a parent. And a lot of it is concentrated through finances. I mean, I've felt that. I've seen other families feel that. And it's like when you're learning about financial literacy, it's like you still have the emotional side battling it. So I, when I try talking with people that it's even finances is even more traumatic for them, I have to check myself and realize like this is bigger because even though I can run the numbers with you, there's something else because maybe it was your 10 year old birthday and you didn't get a gift and your parent lied to you, but you're not ready to tell me that. And it's not until like a way like later time where you say something and I'm able to connect the pieces and I feel like a piece of crap because I'm now having that instilled memory. I've already experienced that through college because being in certain circles where you just assume that maybe a student is certain affluent. And so when you react a certain way, you say certain words that you're not supposed to say, and then you lose a friendship and then you realize like, oh, they have like way deeper family financial issues that I would have never uncovered and I lived with them for two years. And so I think a lot of these parents that are having less kids, they're more protective over them. I'm seeing it compound into other generations. So just because they're having less kids, they're setting them, setting them up financially stronger on paper. That doesn't mean that they're not passing along the financial trauma. And I'm recognizing that a lot with college age people that are trying to get involved, but that involvement requires money. And then when you have to spark that conversation and they're relying on the parent, it like, totally goes south and you're like, whoa, 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 where did that, where did that come from? And that's like not your space to dive into that. And you just have to recognize like, "Hmm, okay, this is a generational financial literacy comfort thing. You know, it's interesting as you talk about generational and money trauma, what we're really talking about is money scripts, right? We grew up with these money scripts that sometimes don't fulfill us and don't help us make financial decisions. I'm wondering if we suffer from that same trauma when it comes to purpose, We're talking about money scripts that are handed down that aren't healthy. Do you think we're also handed down these kind of purpose scripts from our families that that maybe are somewhat also causing this backlash because we feel that purpose is causing us more stress? Absolutely. (laughs) Um, You know, like my sister makes fun of me because she says I read a book and I'm instantly a net promoter. But Mm. uh, this book called The The Happiness Advantage, which I recommend to a lot of people in their older years by Sean Acor. He basically boils down the science of happiness and basically how he says the traditional route of thinking is that if you can make it, then you're successful. And then if you're successful, then you're happy. But And so we expect happiness to be the outcome, but really it should be part of the journey. And he goes through chapter by chapter, approaching it from a very scientific level. And it's one of those books that I was an internal optimist. So I was the naive kid that you wanted to like, okay, I get it. You're happy. So whenever I was able to read this book and boil down like, wow, this is a lot of how I feel. It agrees with a lot of what I feel, but also is restructuring on how I thought about longevity and kind of the one point that I wanted to end on. He was talking about success. And he said, there is this longitudinal study on the largest um, chronological study on happy people in the world. And it was like done over like an X amount of years. And it was a huge compilation study. And the only consistency found with the happiest people in the world was a strength of deep relationships. And that was it. That was it. And so when he said like, it's not location that you live in, it's not the money you make. There's that study that says once you go past like a certain dollar amount, your happiness doesn't increase. It's like 90,000. It might've increased to like 130 based off of inflation. Um, but ultimately it's like their happiness isn't dictated off that, nor is it the amount of people. It's the depth of the relationships. And so he correlated it to like our parents that were like, uh, stayed in the same job for 40 years straight and never bothered to leave. And he's like, it's not because they settled. It's because what was important to them was stability and the deepening of relationships. So if their job provided both of those, why would they ever leave? 
And so for me, being young and recognizing like that's the key, all of my generation is trying to change job every two years because it increases our pay, but it doesn't do anything for the deepening of our relationships. So now I'm seeing a lot of my peer groups that have traveled the world gone to different states, gone to these different really cool job opportunities, but they're going back to their hometowns. They're settling in their hometowns and they're learning the hard way of like, what I really want is the deepening of relationships. And this whole life I've been like, chasing adventure. But what the Sean Acor says in that last chapter is like, if you just realize what you really want is strong relationships, then just prioritize that now and don't waste 10 years trying to figure that out. David, I want to pivot for a moment as you're telling us your beliefs here about purpose and about financial trauma, et cetera, it makes me wonder about your story. Like, are you financially independent? And tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. So I struggle with that insatiable desire for ambition and significance. Like I, my old rules that I used to dictate my life by was like, I must leave a strong grand impression on the world or else what's the point? And probably like six months ago, I've been wrestling that that's a very toxic rule that I created for myself. But I was somebody that I had a chip on my shoulder going through high school, middle school. I was very outspoken in leadership spaces. And so I was always placed like, hey, you'd be great at sales. You could be president of the United States. You know, you could run your own talk show one day. And so I wanted to live up to that. And then whenever I got to college and I threw a lot of things at the wall and saw it sticks, I found purposeful work. I work in fraternity sorority life. I actually left for a period of time and did door to door sales. I wanted to get good at that and I did. And I was making money. And then I thought I got all this time freedom in the other eight months that I wasn't working because door to door sales was seasonal. And then I realized like I like work. Like I, but I need mission driven work. And whenever I was seeking out the answers, I realized like not everybody needs mission driven work. And I realized that the hard way because I was coming to them, almost giving them my confession story. And then I was barking up the wrong tree. They're like, I'm not doing mission driven work. You were asking the wrong person. Like I could quit any day. And I was like, okay, well, I need to find somebody that like actually wants to keep working right now because, you know, I'm in my late twenties and I had that desire. You know, I feel like I could probably join the Peace Corps tomorrow, but at the same time, um, I'm trying to figure out what that is. And so I'm still unlocking that scarce mindset. You know, when, when Diana was talking yesterday, I, I felt that because I think through that upbringing, I think I had some of that uh, financial trauma that was put on me for sure. Um, and the way I thought about money, I mean, you know, past relationships that became something that came up and I realized like, I don't, so one of us is going to have to sell out and it's not going to be me, nor do I want to put you in that situation. So we should probably end the relationship now. Like I've had to go through that and talking about it out loud, people are like, Oh wow, that's a very uh, grown up thing to do. It's like, yeah, but now it's either now or it would have came up five years from now. And I'm so risk adverse to that, um, that I, I'm not as liberated as I want to be in my financial journey. And so I still think about like the, the like last minute calls, the like, well, break the glass in case of emergency. Like growing up in a military family, I think about like, Hey, I know in the state of Texas, if you join the army, you get free tuition for everybody in your family. And I like have this in my head and I almost wish I'd never heard that <laughs> because now it's like, I want to be ambitious and altruistic in what I do. But I also have this looming thing of like, okay, well, if I'm a failure, at least I can provide for my family. I'll just join the army in the, in, in the state of Texas or something like that. And I don't like that. I think that way, but I, I don't hate that. I have that information and I'm very open to give that information but it's always a dichotomy of like, well, do you suggest that? And it's like, well, that's a different story. I don't know if I recommend that or not, because I don't know what my opinion is on that. Like, should you be joining the armed forces for that reason? Some people do for sure. But is that my recommendation? And do I feel credible to give that recommendation? No. But if you just want the info, I have it. And that's where I feel in a very special place. But as a futuristic thinker, it definitely keeps me up at night. So tell me, based on whatever definition you want of purpose, if you have an inkling, do you know what purpose looks in your life like right now? I need to find that job, you know, and I think I've been getting in certain circles, you know, talking with other people of, in terms of like financial literacy and professional development, and leadership development. I think always my fear is like, but can it be sustainable? 
Like I, I like, yeah, I can do that. Like I'd love to do that. And then maybe I'll volunteer sometimes, but like if I want to take the leap, can it be sustainable? But all in all, I think I am that person that uh, like I can see myself dying a penniless man, but being very fulfilled. And I know that that means a lot for me. Whereas like, you know, I'm that kumbaya guy that <laughs> like when you're by a campfire, I'm asking you very like deep, vulnerable questions about meaning of life. You know, that's just who I am. And I know that turns off some people. And so I try not to pry. But I think who I think I am is that like if I found purpose through creating a family, passing along this information, whether that's to my own kids or to family or to people that are willing to listen and creating that space, speaking, using the power of vision. Like that's my style is like empowering through a shared vision, you know, sharing stories. And, you know, my saying is, you know, I don't believe in strangers, just friends that I haven't met yet. That's kind of my purpose is like making as many genuine connections as, po- as I possibly can without any agenda. But it's always like that push and pull of like, but I also need to survive. And so I think my purpose is kind of just like, okay, um, as long as I do what inspires me and scares me and I'm learning, I don't really care what happens. I just need to keep doing those things. And I think I will figure out the answer along the way. And then maybe we did this podcast 20 years from now. Like, did you find your purpose? I was like, yeah, by accident, because I was doing all those things. We are here at Camp Fi Southwest. Let me hear some noise. We talked to Jeremy and David about purpose, financial independence, and whether this idea that purpose can be toxic or at least not be necessary when we're figuring out the rest of our lives. We are welcoming Elle to the microphone. Elle, we're so happy to have you here. Tell me, are you financially independent at the moment? I actually always felt that way. So it was not a destination that I ever felt I arrived I always felt like I had a lot of independence in creating what I needed financially. So that always gave me a lot of joy. So it was kind of more an exciting thing to do something that I like to do and get paid and then get the money from it. And that actually felt my definition of financial independence. I'm independent to make money in the world. And that was always been really fun. So. Maybe it's just a different metaphor about it. Like we talk about it in this space of um, this camp as like a journey, a destination, somewhere you arrive to. I've never thought about it in that sense. Elle, tell me a little bit about how you spend your time. What consumes it on a regular basis? Um, I homeschool two children and have done so for the last 16 years. So that's the full-time work I'm currently doing. So I'm full-time mom, um, solely in charge of their education. We don't use any online courses, any ex- external teachers or anything like that. So it's solely my responsibility. That's the chunk of the time. And we use travel as a part of that. So we travel extensively, both internationally and around the U.S. as part of their education. And I kind of just look at the world as taking a load off of my shoulders because they have conversations with people, they have experiences and they get to make those experiences mean what they do to them. So it's not me imposing information as this is important information that you need to know, experience the world and figure out what's important to you. So they'll come away from an experience and say, that was really interesting. And then that kind of leads what we research and what we focus on and what we read about. So it's very much interest led. So I'm facilitating that. Up into this point in the podcast, we've been talking a lot about purpose and I want to shift for a moment to identity. One of my favorite exercises to do with identity is to ask yourself or say the statement I am and then fill in the blank. We did this earlier today at Camp Vi and I was interested by your response. Tell me, how did it make you feel when I asked that question to the audience? Um, Well, I think how you presented it was, yeah, I am and then fill in the blank. And if I fill in the blank, I feel suffocated. I feel like I'm putting myself in a box and separating myself from the world. So it just creates like a cage for me and it doesn't allow freedom. So for me, the ultimate form of freedom is the lack of necessity to define myself. 
So the more free I am to be and express myself in the world, the more free I feel and the more alive I feel. So if you ask me to like define it, then it's like not magical. It's an interesting viewpoint. We're talking about you, not necessarily everyone else. You're, sure. you're talking about what feels right for you. Right. Do you think when we talk about the greater world that identity can be limiting? Do you think it limits us when we stick to an identity or, or feel that that really defines us? I do. I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody because I realize that there's a lot of things at play. I mean, identity and purpose can be like a psychological tool. So that's how I look at it. It's a tool and it's not purpose, like with a capital P like it. And we even like the metaphor around it is we're searching for it. We will find it as if it's purpose with a capital P versus something that we place on things that we choose to. So I choose to find purpose in being here with everybody, but I'm the one placing the purpose on it. Right. So it's not something that I'm searching for. It's not something I spend time doing because it distracts from like self-expression and things that are naturally in the world that are really amazing. So like the ability to choose one's way throughout the day is really satisfying inherently. Like I make so many choices every day. that are a form of self-expression that are so delightful. And if I wasn't thinking about those and I was thinking about finding, searching a purpose with a capital P, I would be searching for something outside of myself instead of having the luxury and the privilege of having a day full of self-expression. What do I want to wear today? I'm listening to the birds and I get to be grateful for that. And I get to like feel grateful. I don't really concern myself with like, purpose that I need to go find. It's interesting because what jumps to mind as I listen to you talk is it's almost like a lack of creativity, right? In a sense, I feel like you're saying defining ourselves by the certain identity or even by naming this purpose that's going to be somewhat guiding for us. What we're really doing is stifling our creativity. Um, well, I think it's a separation from, okay. So like if you see children playing on a playground, right? They want to, they want to belong, And they want to have fun and they want to play. And when they want to interact with other people, they don't worry about the purpose and their identity to do so. They're just naturally expressing themselves and having a great time. And then somewhere along the line, we're asked, and like my two kids, my oldest, when she's asked by adults, what are you going to be when you grow up? She's like, that's the most uninteresting question you could ever ask me. (laughs) It's not interesting. And I don't want to say, because how do I know that question? And then we still ask ourselves that same question throughout our whole life. What do we want to be when I grow up? What's my purpose? And it's, at the end of the day, uninteresting to me. It's more like, what, what lit you up today? Or what can I do today that feels good. And that's interesting to me to explore. And the more I do the things that feel that way, the more I'm able to show up as like a good human being in the world, because I'm so full by letting things that are around you feel meaningful. One thing I've learned about human beings by being a podcaster and by being in this community is we like guardrails. We like guardrails because they know and help us decide what lane to be in. When I hear you talk about maybe that purpose or identity can be stifling, can they also be centering? Well, I mean, like I think of um, Viktor Frankl and obviously him having a purpose gave him something to focus on. And that book is beautiful and it's an amazing experience that he had. So I don't have anything wrong with someone finding great value and purpose, but I think it's because it's a psychological tool that sometimes we need. A concentration camp would be a great time to use any tool at your disposal. And so I look at purpose as a way to focus the mind on something that alleviates the natural 
chatter that goes on in your brain, ruminating, focusing on things that don't feel good in the body. And so if purpose and focus help you do that, that's great. But at the end of the day, it's not something outside that you need to go find. It's a tool that you can use to help your well-being and create meaning in your life if that's something that works for you. We're talking Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. Elle, did you think you'd be talking about these things at a money conference? I didn't think I'd be talking on a podcast at all. <laughs> <laughs> but in general, in the, did you think in general we'd be talking about this kind of stuff at a financial well, you know podcast? What? The reason that I'm or, here is because, um, again, I've spent a lot of time homeschooling my kids, and that's been my focus, right? Um, but I don't even think of that as my purpose, right? I mean, I had children. They're my responsibility, so it's something I do, and I find a lot of joy. But I do not have this, like way of looking at it, like my purpose is to educate my children because my children are going to be educated in the world and I'm privileged to get to be a part of it. And I just find it so fun. Um, but I'm starting to now think, well, what do I, um, what do I enjoy that is separate from them? They're now 16 and 13. So that question naturally starts to come to mind. And for me to have like meaningful conversation and already have something that I align with, which this community is just generous and kind and accepting, it's much more about that for me. Um, so yeah, I come here because I expect to have awesome, meaningful conversations. So this is not a surprise that we're talking about something like this because it's people like you that are asking questions like this. And I knew that I would find it here, which is why I'm here. Well, I wanted to thank Jeremy, David, and Elle for coming on the show today. We come here to talk about money because money is this amazing tool. And I always thought that part of this idea behind money is it allows us to pursue purpose and identity. But as David was talking about, we have these financial traumas and we have these money scripts but what maybe I didn't realize is that we also have these purpose and identity scripts, and those two possibly can cause trauma. So for some people, having those guardrails, using purpose and identity in order to forge the life they want to live is very helpful. But for other people, it puts them in a box and maybe limits them or brings up traumas from their childhood or generational trauma where this idea of purpose and identity were used as weapons or ways that didn't make them feel good. I think these are the kind of conversations we have at places like Camp Fi. We're not only talking about money, but we're talking about what happiness and contentedness look like. Is there such thing as purpose and identity and what role they play in their lives? I wanted to thank you all for coming on the show today. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. That's a wrap. So if anyone wants to be part of the podcast, if you'd like to be part of the after show, I'm going to get up and you can sit in front of this microphone and say a few words about purpose, important, not important, anything you want. But if you want to be part of the after show, any of you can come up and do it. I'm going to move and please feel free. It's really one of the most fun parts of the podcast is actually the after show. You don't have to say your name. It can be completely anonymous or you can say your name if you want to. So... Whatever you want. The mic is yours, but I'm going to leave it open for five minutes. Purpose doesn't always have to be great things. Uh, my purpose in life right now is, is pretty simple, and it's just to be available to other people and to be uh, encouraging. And there's many, many people I know that need encouragement, and I know I do sometimes. So uh, I don't have a gram grand scheme in life, but those things are important to me now, and I'm trying to share that. So this is Mark, and uh, 
I'm really enjoying being here at Camp Fi. And I would just say that sometimes purpose um, is hard to find. And I found that after retirement, I didn't know what my purpose uh, would be because I didn't think about it ahead of time. Um, and what I found was that <clears throat> my purpose, <clears throat> excuse me, my purpose found me. And that was uh, teaching financial literacy at the local high school. So sometimes you just have to be open for trying new things and purpose can sometimes find you. So it's not always about finding purpose, um, but sometimes, like I said, it can find you and just be open to new things and try new things. It may not all work out, um, but ultimately, I think you'll find your purpose. So I took a life coaching class a couple of years ago, and one of the exercises was actually to create a life purpose statement. And my statement uh, went through a lot of iterations, a lot of looking at thesaurus.com for synonyms. And the way it came out was, I am the spirited force that motivates people to reach their maximum potential. And for me, I appreciate having guardrails um, in my life. And so while it's not necessarily super prescriptive when I am exploring new and different ideas, I appreciate having that lens of does this kind of fit into my life purpose statement and what does that look like? But I'm definitely still searching. I want to give an excerpt. I paraphrased and did not give credit earlier to, a, I thought, a pretty cool quote. Um, the uh, author of the book, Eat, Pray, Love, which was later turned into a movie, she was famously quoted from when she was at this thing called the World Happiness Summit, which who wouldn't want to be there? I, I need to figure out how to get tickets. Um, but she gave this quote, which was then later told to me, probably in like the month of August, so not too long ago. She was talking to like a sea of people that were like the average age was like 55. She was saying that uh, at this World Happiness Summit, everybody was asking these questions during the Q&A. And she was like, time out, time out. Everybody's talking about their life's purpose. And she said, the way she saw it when she was writing the book, because the book is a lot about her going through that eat, pray, love phase, kind of in the sunset of her career, going through what some call a midlife crisis. She had said, you know, if you spend your whole life chasing what you love and what you inspire, and yet you get to the end of the road and you didn't figure out what your life's purpose was, well, then the worst case scenario is that you just spent your whole life chasing what you love and what inspires you. So is that really so bad? And I heard this as like a 27 year old. I'm like, wow, I thought that was the key. And so like, I took that quote with me and I just didn't paraphrase that well. And so I wanted to give her credit. Don't know the name, but Eat, Pray, Love. Great movie. Elizabeth Gilbert. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. That was awesome.